sorry, Prince, but I've spent my last day in the Fairyport Landing lockup. My fans are wait. Jack said, loading another arrow into his bow and firing it at the giant. It pierced the skin between the between two fingers of the giant's left hand and he shrieked. Overcome with rage, the giant swept his arm across the tops of the forest trees, cracking many ancient cedars in half. A sizable chunk of wood fell from the sky and nearly hit Charming in the head. Oh, he's angry now, the giant killer laughed, loading his arrow again. This time, he aimed it at Charming. Jack, don't, Sabrina cried. I was hoping it wouldn't have to come to this, he said, as he lined up his arrow with Charming's heart. But don't worry, I promise to have him spell your name correctly in your obituary. He released his arrow, and the ghost watched it soar through the air at Charming. Daphne screamed and squeezed her sister's hand, knowing Jack's aim was true. But something happened the girls didn't expect. Charming lifted Excalibur slightly, and the arrow bounced off its metal blade and fell to the ground. Jack was flabbergasted. What luck you have, he cried. Try again and see if it was luck, the prince said, stepping forward with the sword. With hands like lightning, Jack fired another arrow and Charming deflected it with similar results. Jack pulled three arrows from his quill and lined them up together on his bow. He fired them all at the same time. Sabrina watched in amazement as Charming guided Excalibur to block each from their deadly course. I can do this all night, the prince bragged, but just then the giant's monstrous hand swung down and hit him from behind. Excalibur was knocked free of his grip and fell at Sabrina's feet. Charming was sent staring through the forest, landing painfully against the tree and slumping through the ground. Jack pulled more arrows from his quill, let them move the light to Sabrina Ragnar from Granny's kitchen and fired five off with furious speed. Each landed in more of the giant's sensitive spots. The painful barrage was enough to get the giant to back off, giving the young man an opportunity to turn the girls. He put another arrow into his bow and aimed it at Sabrina. Instinctively, Sabrina reached down and snatched Excalibur from the ground. It was incredibly heavy and bulky, but she swung around in the air the best she could. And what do you think you're going to do with that, duck? Jack scoffed as he stepped toward her. Grims aren't killers. You don't have it in you. Well, we're kind of new at this job. If we break a couple of rules, that just goes with the learning process, Sabrina said with as much bravery as she can muster. Her courage was short-lived. As Jack got closer, she noticed something painted on her shirt. It was a red hand, just like the one that the police had found in her parents' abandoned car. It sent a chill through her body. You took my parents, Sabrina said. Jack looked down at the red hand and smiled. No, girl, I didn't, but I know who did. The Scarlet Hand has plans for them. Where are they? Daphne cried. He laughed. You know, I grew up reading about you, Sabrina said, trying to keep him busy. You have a very exciting story. You climbed the beanstalk, killed a giant, and captured the treasure. Lots of kids think of you as a hero. But not you. Once, but not now. Now that I've met you, the real Jack, I see what a rotten person you are. That's what you're famous for now, Jack. Not being a giant killer, but being scum. Give me the sword, girl, so I can cut your tongue out of it, he threatened. Daphne, I want you to run away and get some help, Sabrina said. She knew she couldn't deflect Jack's arrow and didn't want her sister to see her die. I won't do it, Daphne insisted. Jack pulled his bowstring back further and, just as he was about to fire his arrow, his giant's foot came down on top of him, giving the man only a split second to leap out of the way. Daphne grabbed his sister's hand, and together they raced into the forest, dodging trees and branches. Jack followed closely behind, and was the giant strode after him. Its first step landed several yards behind him. An arrow whizzed by and impaled itself into a nearby tree. That was a warning shot, ladies, the young man shouted as he loaded another arrow. I'm quite good with this thing. Suddenly, the two guys were slipping down the side of a hill and into an ice cold creek. Another arrow splashed in the water at Sabrina's feet as they pulled themselves out of the stream and continued to run. With now frozen feet, they did their best to avoid the jagged rocks that littered the forest floor. 
but soon Sabrina took a tumble and fell end over end across the ground. She tried to stand up and quickly realized she was missing something. Her left shoe, Dorothy's left slipper, lay glistening in the moonlight behind her. It had fallen off. Come on, Daphne begged as she tried to help her big sister to her feet. But Sabrina crawled desperately toward the shoe. It was their only chance of finding their parents. She used her arms to pull herself along the ground, knowing that Jack would fall upon her at any second. But before she could reach it, the giant's foot came down hard on top of the slipper. The, the vibrations shook the girls and sent them tumbling. When the giant lifted his foot, the shoe was gone. The only thing remaining was a piece of glistening fabric that held the dust in Sabrina's outstretched hand. Heartbroken, Sabrina pulled her sister behind a huge oak tree and the two of them rested. Don't worry, don't worry, I'll think of something, she said, squeezing her sister's hand. But the sound of a monstrous crash drowned Sabrina's hands and flooded the forest. Splintering wood and damp soil rained from the sky as the tree they stood next to was violently uprooted. The two girls looked up into the face of death towering above them and felt its hot, pungent breath below the hair back on their scalps. What's happened to our lives? Sabrina wondered. The giant tossed the tree aside and then reached down with his grubby hand to pick them up. But just as he did, Sabrina thrust Excalibur into the air. The giant's hand plunged into its blade and suddenly his eyes lit up in surprise. What was that? he asked softly. He stood up as if he were a was in a daze, unsure of even of where he was. The anger in his face melted away, replaced by a sort of calm curiosity, and he began to wobble on his feet. Unable to keep his balance, he sailed backward, lying flat on his back and crushing an acre of forest beneath him. A thick cloud of dust rose above his body and settled down on all around him. Half a pound of soil landed in Sabrina's blonde hair, and then all was still. I didn't mean for that to happen, Sabrina said, looking in horror at the sword still clutched in her hand. Granny, Rhoda, and Mr. Canis? Daphne whispered as tears filled her eyes. Jack rushed through the brush and saw the giant lying dead on the ground. You've killed him, he said angrily. I was going to kill him. It's over, Jack, Sabrina said. It's not over until I say it is, Jack raged. I'm going to be famous again, but for another reason. Tonight, the Ever Afters of Fairyport Landing are going to find that they to find they are suddenly free from the spell that has kept them in this mercilessly boring town for two centuries. With your grandma now dead, the spell turns to the last living grim. Some might be patient enough to wait for you two to die of old age, but I am not. This ends tonight. Chapter eleven. Jack rushed forward and violently shoved Sabrina to the ground. Daphne lunged at him, but she received the same treatment. Sabrina had dropped a scalibur in the floor, and Jack quickly picked it up, admiring its blade for a moment, and then readying himself to bring it down on Sabrina's head. They're going to have a parade in my honor for this, the young man said with a sick smile. Suddenly, a loud, wheezing honk filled the night. Jack spun around. In a giant's breast pocket, a wonderful thing happened. Two headlights blinked to life. An engine roared, backfired violently, and then, with a squeal of tires, the family car ripped through the pocket and sped along the giant's body. At the wheel was Mr. Canis and, next to him, Granny Rhoda. Safe and sound, the car soared over the giant's gelatinous belly, down his leg, and hit his huge kneecap, sending the car sailing into the air. It landed several yards away from Jack and the girls and skidded to a stop. The engine put it out, the lights went down, and the car's doors opened. Granny Rhoda stepped out with a very concerned face. Jack, what is the meaning of this? she asked. The young man pulled the mason jar of beans out of his jacket and held it up. It's about this old woman. It's about capturing my rightful place in the spotlight, Jack said. Those days are over. Mr. Kenneth said as he stepped out of the car. Maybe for you, traitor, Jack thought, but I've got bigger plans than selling shoes and measuring hemlines. These beans are going to make me a hero of them. But for that to happen, some things have to change around here. What are you suggesting? Granny Rhoda asked. 
The grooms have to die. You know I won't allow that, Jack, Mr. Kenneth said. I've been killing giants since I was a lad. I suspect I won't have too much trouble from old Mutt like you. Mr. Kenneth looked over to Granny Brother. Something passed between them. A sort of question and answer that only the two of them shared. Granny Rhoda nodded in approval, and Mr. Kenneth took off his hat. If you want to stick your dog on me, Grim, then do it. But I'll have my destiny either way, Jack said, putting a jar of beans back into his jacket and swinging a scallop around menacingly. I've been waiting for this for a very long time. Mr. Kenneth smiled in a way Sabrina could only describe as eager. Once again, she was sure he was doomed. The old man had managed to take out three overweight goons, but could he handle a lightning fast layer of giants carrying a sword that killed anything it touched? Jack charged wildly, screaming into the air, but before he could even swing the deadly sword, a change came over Mr. Canis. His shot ripped off his chest as his body doubled in size. His feet snapped and stretched as they transformed into paws. Hands sprang from every inch of skin. Fangs crept down over his lips, his nose extended out, replaced by a snarling stare, and the tops of his ears twisted into points and raised to the top of his head. Most disturbing, but the most disturbing were his eyes, as they changed into an achingly bright blue color, the same color Kenneth's eyes were in the picture Sabrina had found of her family. The transformation was complete. Mr. Canis had turned into a wolf the size of a rhinoceros. Bring it on, little man, the wolf snarled as it jumped up on its back legs. Sabrina could hear a hint of Mr. Canis's voice in the wolf's growl, but the way he said the word told nothing of her grandmother's feeble old friend's call. The wolf's voice was full of viciousness. The wolf charged his jack and sent him hustling backward into a tree, giving the young man no time to recover as the wolf sent. Nervously set unk its teeth into Jack's right arm. Jack screamed in agony. With the wolf on top of him, he couldn't swing the deadly sword. The best he could do was hit the beast on the head with Excalibur's handle. The wolf backed away, slightly dazed, and then licked its lips. Bad news for you, Jack. The wolf barked. I know your taste now and I like it. In the commotion, Granny held out her arms for the girls and they ran to her side. Everything will be fine, Granny consoled them. You didn't tell us Mr. Canis was one of them, Sabrina said. Oh, didn't I? Yes, Mr. Canis is the big bad wolf, Granny said as she kept her eyes on the fight. The big bad wolf? The girls cried. The wolf lunged at Jack, ripping his chest with its razor-sharp claws. Jack swung back and punched the beast in the face, but the wolf just chuckled. Desperately, the young man jumped up, grabbed a tree branch, and used it to catapult himself and the wolf. The four sent them both tumbling over each other, leaving Jack on top. When I kill you, this town is going to erect a statue in my honor, Jack busted. How does it feel to know that your own kind wish you dead? Not nearly as bad as, it, as bad as it must feel to know they don't care if, they, you are, if you are alive, the wolf snarled as it rolled over on top of Jack. Maybe they'll notice when I leave your rotten corpse hanging in the town square. That is, after I've eaten all the juicy paws. Jack thrust his knee into the wolf's belly, knocking the wind out of it and giving the young man the chance to throw the beast off. He crawled to his feet and picked up Excalibur. Even the tiniest scratch will send you on your way, Mongo, Jack warned. He rushed forward, pushed the beast against the tree, and held the lethal bait into its neck. Perhaps they will now call me Jack the Legend Killer as well. Sabrina looked at her grandmother and saw the worry in her face. She knew Jack was going to win, and that he would turn on them. How would the three of them fight him off? But suddenly, after the snarling and fighting, she heard an odd sound, as if someone had just played some notes on a flute. At first, the brilliant thought she might have imagined it, but I swore the pixies. This video, I'll say.